this really amazing rating. Um, the, sort of like the impetus was was uh, behind this was um, um, I'd asked, I think I'd asked Dennis whether um, he'd organized a reading for, for his book. Um, and then we we're like, oh, we should just organize one ourselves. And I've really sort of admired um, Valerie's um, Val Valerie's new new book from from SA Press, and it just seemed like such a fantastic opportunity to bring all three amazing, or including myself. I guess I'm pretty amazing too. Um, um, uh, uh, to to read to um, um, uh, together, and so um, we're going to go, I guess, in in, in order of um, uh, the the program. But you know, before I actually before I, I read Valerie's, um, 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 who's going to read be the, uh, her bio note before, um, um, I really wanted to sort of um, thank um, really SA Press um, for bringing us all together um, in really sort of amazing, amazing ways. So, you know, um, if we, uh, uh, you could do a virtual pull, uh, applause, but, but please, please that extend your gratitude to SA Press, to Travis, Katie, Megan, Claire, and Blair, and um, everyone who sort of um, also even past authors, this whole amazing community of, of, of writers. Um, I really sort of love this press. I've always um, I just found that their publications are just really sort of stunning and really also critically necessary and in so many unique ways. So so I guess, you know, this is this, if, if we could dedicate a, a reading to 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 it, to to SA Press and this this reading is really dedicated uh, to you all for putting together such fantastic um, for doing such fantastic work. But you're all really here for uh, for the readers, and so um, let me um, introduce you to the introduce to the stage to the virtual stage. Valerie, Valerie Xiong, who, who is the author of multi, multiple poetry and hybrid writing collections. Um, and I'm really excited about this 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 new collection, The Knife from Ugly Duckling Press, which is forthcoming from next year and next year. Um, um, she's also the author of The Only Name We Can Call It Now Is Not Its Only Name by Counterpath. And of course, To Love an Artist uh, from Essay uh, Press, which was amazingly selected by Renee Gladman for the 2021 uh, Essay Press Book Prize. Um, born in the year of the earth snake and raised by Chinese Taiwanese uh, immigrants in Cincinnati, Ohio. She now lives in the mountains of Colorado, where she teaches as an assistant professor of creative writing and poetics at Naropa's Jack Kuryak School of Disembodied Poetics. Please welcome Valerie. Thank you so much, Orchid. And yes, thank you so much to Essay. I think um, when you're in it, in the bookmaking process, it's easy to forget that you're working with this, in my opinion, revolutionary press who has published some of my favorite books ever. And it's just, it really is a dream that doesn't seem real to be counted in that company. Um, and of course, to have had the book read uh, by Renee was, was, incredible incredible um so I'm, I'm really thankful for everyone at essay and for the authors as well thank you orchid for putting this together i'm excited to hear both orchid and dennis read today i'll read uh i'll begin with my book from essay and then depending on the time i'll um finish with some newer work my mother worked at a desk my father worked at a desk my mother's mother's family owned desks, beautiful hand carved desks, cabinets, bureaus, and they owned land when the Red Guards took over. They were considered land owning intellectuals who needed to be imprisoned or executed in a public square publicly. Growing up, I would have terrible dreams. None of them included being labeled nebulously, not nebulously. Chinese trailer trash. All of my friends growing up were trailer trash or good Christian working class. Of course, I don't include the near classless Taiwanese American immigrant enclave I was also raised within. These breeders of ours had already been obliterated by someone else's class consciousness. Growing up, we weren't good enough to be with their middle class, so we occasionally settled for their trailer trash. We saw the hypocrisy. 
My first time alone in the new house, I invited a friend over to put on makeup together, a friend who would be considered trailer trash thus. I tried to remember everything I've already said. When I lie on my back now, I feel depositional to my own understanding of being seen, having been. I am not alone. Even now, when I am completely alone, I feel nothing, spots all over, roughly, protracted and towards the wall. Advertisements would find no relief here, where gravity is worth more. The dryness in the air which consumes the dampness brings the lameness of the shadow back to the sun and wall, whose arrangement I have misconstrued. Odd then, being faced with it. And so when I approach like that, all of it can just vanish away from me. You take for granted things like cut fruit in a bowl in the mini fridge without cover. I will learn quickly. I am still learning. On the farm, I only ever lived on vegetable and roots, sometimes cheese, some cured fish, two cheesemongers, a couple who were not the only nomads of the village, of course, would come by to visit us quite frequently, sometimes once a week, sometimes twice, and when they did, they would bring us their cheeses, and I was fond of them and their visiting, as though it was my own home, one of them sharing my name freakishly. When the day turns into night, I think of the land, the pesticides all combed through, as well as what exactly it is that has nourished us for so long. The woman who led us through at the toll booth, which reminds me of the safety of another kind of booth and where we would be wanderers says, go before I change my mind. A laugh, I taste it in my mind not like a lozenge, but like a licorice root. I have a friend, I have an old friend. I know the Piedra Terra has already been combed through by local authorities because I felt less perverted in that neighborhood because I trust any perversion there would be more rooted, less separated from the core harshness of its belonging perversion. I know it's been combed through. I guess we speak of life on fleet. In 2013, I consciously left the city of angels to consciously leave the city of angels and don't look back. Heavens, as a clue, I no longer refer to Los Angeles as Los Angeles. Heaven has a friend. We are separated by degrees like math. In the, in the car, I would learn of Toronto, finally, and finally you of Las Vegas. I know someone who lives there, I'd share, in a pillar, someone very close to me. In the car, we give an audio tape you never returned to the New York Public Library, a try after years of it being overdue, though apparently unlistened to. I can't hear the author's own voice from the tape, so we eject the disc and decide to no longer listen to anything. My mother brushed her teeth too vigorously. My father brushed his teeth too vigorously. I brushed my teeth efficiently, but conscious also of the delicateness of these gums. I brushed my teeth not too vigorously, but not out of mutiny, out of learning. What does the meteor ask? My mother would open the, strange, the door to strangers. My father would open the door to strangers. The anguish, the decoy lifting up a dirty penny within itself. I did not grow up listening to jaded intellectuals. The intellectuals who told us to listen were anachronistically idealistic intellectuals, also workaholics and anachronistically given to devices, at least until we left home. Even then though, the device persisted. They would say, listen up now, but when they said it, it was to the wrong people like they were doing it. And by the time they stopped paying attention, the people who listened arrived, the people who listened without being told to listen, except by then there was nothing to listen to. They got it all wrong in the right way. I will wait outside in the morning sun while everyone is off to work. And I will wait here, waiting for the clients. The building won't be sold. 
It takes a lot of guts to go steadfastly into the wind, no matter what direction it is blowing. The scariest thing is not being able to get your chemicals back. There are no high dramatics there. Everyone is smiling today. Everyone, even the adolescent ghosts, adore smiling today. I am surprised by the lack of commerce, but then I'm reminded that higher level power has a different requirement of commerce than mid-level power. Not all freight is equal. But then I am reminded we have either neglect or gluttony, or neglect and gluttony are extinct. What will her best play be even about, even if, if she isn't willing to give her addictions to it? If she wants to take each one of those addictions out, to place each one of them in keeping for herself, she is not the one woman play after all. This isn't the clue. She is not the one woman to play me. She is neither the cubicle, the cube, the follicle, nor the ice. It was truly just the mutiny of two war rep reporters sensationalizing their reportage and making an affair of it for book sales. I once played the real life ordinary pimp for one of them. Can you believe? And that's the thing with accents. The plays high on concept always is the people being played, their names. Their names are merely stand-ins, of course, in a way that the war reporters are not stand-ins for anything except stand-ins of themselves, of course. After the march, we never did revisit it, it again. Later, when visiting another major site, I asked you to reenact the old photograph. First, you don't understand. I just want a copy. When what you want is a portrait to commemorate, and so much of barely being there. It's time to kill time, she says, and it's okay to throw wet pennies up against the ceiling, and it's okay to kill time. We wait, we will kill time. You cut three shells, you give me back my wigs, and the body is consumptive, or it was tied like a bouquet to the train tracks. When we let this go, when we let it go on for too long, when they love us and they're a force, it compiles, accumulates. Over the years, too much gets tossed around, not addressed. I must pull back. I must pull back from earth, move my body into the grain. When I make puns out of newfound language, I watch folk as they pass along a trail. It isn't ours. For instance, when the master demands a constraint from the master's apprentice, it's because the master needs the constraint of the apprentice. On the outside, the master might look like they are the idiot. When I got home, I stripped everything off, trust it with my life. If instructions are laid beforehand, instructions down to the wire. She was so good with instructions. It was what made her perspire. Wish I could trust it without instructions. Wish for a day without work. She didn't want to blame anyone for her jowl, but it was coming like time and a rose. Do you think John is scared to look me all the way through? Sometimes I feel like I could be see-through, and that's what I do for John. When John is sleeping tonight, I will send him my thoughts. When you are see-through, that's what you can do. When John is sleeping tonight, I will tell him how they try to gouge out my third eye, making a clean dig. When I looked in the mirror, it felt as though I'd never had a third eye, and it cut me to the core. I must confess I felt very empathetic to that core. And then a few weeks later, why it started to grow back. What is inside me like melanin? No one can gouge out that once this third eye stay. This is enough of a test for John. If John passes this test well, I don't know. Maybe then I can ask him to confirm. Maybe then I can send out other tests of my complete see-through. 
John, John, do you know who? Do you see? Have you seen me? Can you tell? Would you tell on me? It's okay. Okay, John, I have passed enough tests for the both of us, and I'll, I'll get you in. Why not? Why did we come here? We didn't need to come here, but it was another place for us to go. Did we think we could come here to thresh? Who would think this would be a place for one to do one's threshing? Though we are not brought to any precipice, in the flatness of this place is a hiddenness, a road around which we cannot see beyond the threshing, beyond coming and going. Yet between each hiddenness is there a flatness within which there is a dwelling. That's not why we could have come here to stay. How did the first two humans come to know how to mate? Sometimes I walk around and think how strange all of us clothed the way we are. Sometimes I walk around and I notice how one person is clothed the way they are, and then another person is clothed another way, and then the first person makes a street turn, and then another person walks up driveway toward a house, let's say. Do they take off their clothes once they disappear from my view? There was something about this girl that drew Miss Antarctica to her too. It was the way she could make a grown man blush inside by the way she talked, because what she said was serious, that Miss Antarctica always wanted, but had always gone about in the wrong way. If you were left alone for a long enough time with this girl, she would eventually absorb you. If you were left alone in a hatchery working side by side with this girl, she would eventually absorb all of you, even if she didn't want to. There were only a few structures on the island which announced their presence loudly to the inhabitants of the island. Your eye drew up to it, this structure, but from which center did they emanate? It should be said, however, of these structures that they did not draw your eye the way a place off-island might draw it, the way something one might consider or call a monument might draw your eye. It should be said as well that these structures, which announce their presence, seem to announce their presence, yes, but unlike other structures one might consider or call a monument for the center from which they emanated this presence, could never truly be detected. Did you ever find it strange that the type of person who could be contained, content to be contained, content to go from smooth to sun-baked, did you ever find it strange that the type of person who could go very far, go very far into the estuary, could conceive and conceive and conceive, did you ever find it strange that the type of person who could go very far, go very far into the estuary, would never want to stray? Make sure you are back inside once the outside starts changing. Go outside now before it'll be changing outside by the time you need to come back inside. It will be changing soon enough. You won't be able to stay outside long enough. You'll have to start walking back. When you start walking back, you'll be tempted to do so backwards. I will draw your eye very far inside into my monument. I could be John Center, no. Though this is a monument, and a monument is a thing the 20 children anywhere else would play their games around, and that's what they want them to do. I will draw your eye towards the flatness around every corner. It's a fine feeling when the most monumental thing on this island is the monument on that other little island with the other little freaks. 
My negotiations with John today have been less productive than usual. I think when we first began negotiating, I was enraptured, though my waters were ostensibly quite still and John didn't know that I could even have another motive. And though he still may not know that we are the ones who have other motives. I think because my rapture has gone more and more into the background, he feels that this action of negotiating will no longer get him whatever he thought I would accompany him on. When I was born, I was already a year old, one year. So I'm one of those whose birth year is always bound to be slashed. I was always one or zero, 10 or 11, that kind of thing. When I was born, the quilt was not yet handmade. The quilt was machine born. When I was born, I came out falling towards the ground. I came out falling towards the soil. I came out falling towards the hooves, untangling themselves the way hooves do when frenzy comes, when they sense they are prey towards these hooves and the broken feet and all the hooves. So, and so it's high time. Did John's center stop growing to fit into the container that held him? Didn't John's center grow only as much until the container said no? Did John try to grow and then at night when he was put back into his container, his center became blunted? I brace myself in the street. No one knows about my brace but me and one other person who doesn't even know where I belong tonight. When you hear 40 years ago, do you hear today? What about 50? When we first got here, I nodded in disbelief when they mentioned how here nobody locks their doors, how locking a door is an aberration here. It took me two months to give it a shot, actually. Still, each time I have a moment because locking it has become so ingrained in me that I feel they are trying to reach my numb pacifism or something until they have it, until they have finally found our numb pacifism and at that point, they can just do whatever they want. I've had to become this way, I suppose, so that what you see as what you get has come by way of getting because it saw. I said, well, I can be it like that. I volunteered. I suppose I came across as some kind of joke, and for a while this threatened to crush me, but somehow it didn't. Somehow I became practically marvelous at jokes until I didn't have to tell a single one. People would be very confused. Sitting at a table, I would say nothing, and then, and then I would ask a question, and then another question, and then another question, and then as though by accident, although everyone knew it wasn't an accident, I would also tell a joke. What would happen to us if, how many of us would it take? How few of us do we need? How many of us in a room? How many of us around a table? How many cilia on me until I become detectable? What would happen to us if, we latched on to the wrong thing. If we mistakenly believed the thing we were latching onto or the thing we were supposed to latch onto when, when in fact, it was just the container holding us. Thank you. What I did say, I was just full of praise, Valerie. That was just such a fantastic, fantastic reading. Um, I, I was just trying to find words to describe, um, describe that reading and all that I could sort of think was just, um, you write so materially, so embodiedly. Um, um, uh, I keep on sort of thinking about how, how, how your language just leaves me with, with ear hunger. I, I, I don't know. It was just so I'm not being, I'm being, I'm being absolutely sincere as well. Like it was just so it was, that was just absolutely absolutely amazing so thank you very much for sharing your words thank you so much uh where's my notes 
Right. Um, well, I, going from one amazing reader to, to the next, I'm really excited to bring Dennis James Sweeney uh, to, the, to, the, to the floor. Uh, uh, Dennis is the author of You're the Woods 2, um, also published by SA Press just this year, and in the Arctic, Antarctic at Circle by Autumn House Press in 2021, as well as several chapbooks of poetry and prose, including Ghost Home, A Beginner's Guide to Being Haunted, um, by Ricochet Editions in 2020. His writing has appeared in Echo Tone, Five Points, Night's Letter, The New York Times, and The Southern Review, among uh, others. Formerly a small press editor of Entropy and as assistant editor of Denver Quarterly, he has an MFA from o Oregon State University, and a PhD from the University of Denver. Originally also from Cincinnati, he li now lives in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, where he teaches at Amherst College. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you so much, Orchid. Um, yeah, we were appreciating the Ohio connections before everybody logged on, and I appreciate um, everybody from Ohio and, and not from Ohio being here. Thank you so much, Orchid, for bringing this together. And Orchid and Valerie, it's a delight to read with you both. I am similarly like blown away by your reading and just left in the state of like awe. So I have to pull myself together to do my own thing here. Um, but also just a delight to, you know, be on SA Press with all of you. And so much thanks to everybody at SA Press for bringing this book into the world. Um, the book I'm going to read from is called You're the Woods 2. It came out in May. Um, kind of really happy to celebrate it with y'all in the room right now. Um, it starts in a theater. Everything is green. The seats are green. The stage is green. The stage lights are green. The curtain hung as a backdrop is green. The balconies are green. The carpet is green. The tracking lights are green. The ceiling is green. No color other than green is possible, not even in the playgoers, for there are no playgoers, only seats in varying shades of green, cushioned by moss, or if you like, occupied by it. The armrests are green. The bolts holding the seats to the floor are green. The music is green, like water flowing through a bed of moss. The aroma is green, the walls are green, the doors of the exits are green and sealed shut by a strangle of vines. The theater has never been degraded by human presence. Instead, the cup holders are green, the or orchestra's pit is green and filled with water, the battens are green, just like everything. And so in this theater, this green theater, a lot of voices kind of walk through. Um, and one of them is the voices of this long line of men, men who are going out in the woods to find themselves, to try to um, achieve some level of self-awareness, but also with this kind of like dominating or conquering attitude. Um, and so I kept following these men, you know, as much as I kind of disagreed with their approach, because um, I've been in that position in my own life and um, was just trying to figure out like, how, how can I come to the woods for some kind of, uh, you know, revelation or something like that, but end up uh, in a place that's that's a little more authentic. And, and so I, I kept trying to track that and I kept, kept following these stories. And, and so here's one of them. I went out in the woods to find myself and the whole woods was myself and the whole sky was the woods and the whole world was the sky. Myself shivered with wholeness. He possessed everything. And everyone who had to live on him murmured with dissatisfaction and passed around petitions against myself but myself didn't care because he was the petitions, the petitions too. Until one day a teenage girl stuck a bobby pin into the surface of myself out of sheer rage. It was nothing. It was all she could do. The whole world heard a hiss. The ground wrinkled and shrank. People stumbled, fell. The wet soil welcomed them with a bruise. And in an instant, myself was nothing but a snail, which the teenage girl watched as it slicked in search of refuse. It dragged its deflated body like a wish. And she would have crushed the snail if she'd remembered her anger, but she did not now that myself was so small. So she trapped it in a Pepsi cup and brought it home with her and placed it next to the sink. Myself lived as long as you could expect a snail to live with no food. And when it died, the girl didn't notice until the seventh day. So you've got these men trying to go into the woods to find themselves. And you also have uh, these poems about moss 
that I was working on for a long time because I, I started working on all of this and a lot of it's coming out of the time when I was living in Oregon, just covered in moss. And I was constantly having this experience of like, this this is all around me and I don't know anything about it, um, but it's it, it sort of makes me feel as if I'm in a living world. And so I was trying to kind of like get, get at moss, um, maybe not moss consciousness, but to give it some sort of name following Robin Wall Kimmer's um, idea that moss usually don't have common names because nobody has bothered with them. It was my goal to bother with them a little bit and also try to find kind of a counterpoint to these men who are tromping through the woods. Um, so I named these poems after moss. This one's called Campylum Stellatum. I was educated in stocks and fences. Mrs. Kenny went home to God. Mrs. Giddings stood four feet tall. We made a holiday out of our falling. I learned that hunger is sightless. Dogs can ruin a life. Mirrors, identify or not, two people walk into your life. The doorbell plays the old fight song. And this one's called Poganatum, Ernagarum. Stray with or without me. Lock boxes of bombs in the dim lit hills, a hole to serve to the takers who come, gold and margins. Clear basil sheaf. They're really short poems. These next two are just four lines long. This is called Ritidia Delphis, the Reyes. A child walks home in a towel. A bomb hangs from a string. It's easier to treat land like a floor. The clouds only rest when you rest. And Grimia, Anadon. You don't want any of this, do you? Vanilla has lengths, something to frame on. My love for you might never be known to either of us. And so I followed that throughout the book and tried to feel out the juxtaposition between like this long line of men and these moths that were coming in and providing another way of looking at things. And there's other voices in the book and other stories too. Um, but eventually kind of the story of this book opens up when some of these men, um, a particular group of people who are like hiking through the woods, trying to find themselves, trying to go on some sort of adventure. Um, eventually they kind of like find their way to this theater, this like green theater that's never been entered, this kind of um, idyllic, totally natural space. And so that provided for me like the imaginative kind of image of the end of the book, um, what happens when they like go into that space. And, and if I'm in that group, what do I do too? Um, so, so this is when, when this group kind of like arrives at the theater um, that got built in this book. In the theater, a sense of unease is rising. The green lights have begun to dim. They flicker once while the water in the orchestra pit ripples, the long line of men and the moss and a large white sheet hunch against the disturbance. A change in pressure, bad weather, the agitation is getting worse. Now the air hums with the stink of lightning. Water shakes in sheets from the battens. The walls weep heavy drops. The doors begin to rattle as if someone's trying to push them open. The tension between the green seats stretches tighter with each glimmer of the palpitating doors. The theater groans as if it cannot contain what is outside. Then the doors clap open. We stand in the doorway, silhouetted by the lobby's flood of light. The theater, abruptly still, gapes at us. We are tough, dirt creased seasoned with muscle. We are exhausted. In reaching our limit, we found ourselves. We cooked oatmeal with rainwater, brave the constant threat of skies. We were men in the woods. But now in the theater, we feel like ghosts. The green unsettles us. This is the farthest away place, the untouched season we've been looking for. That which alive, that which is alive will never fit in its place. Stepping into the theater, we believe we fit everywhere we go. So we wander through the theater as if we own it. We take shelter among the green as if it is our home. We toss our packs on hillocks of moss. We disperse among the rows to rest our legs. We drape our jackets over the green armrests, which support them silently. I walk down the aisle, round the orchestra pit, 
and sit on the edge of the stage and pull my boots off, dangle my toes in the water. My friends light a fire below. They tear pieces off the large white sheet for fuel, fan the fire with stories, hold their feet to the warmth. Beyond them, I see that we forgot to close the door of the theater. Light enters the room like a flame. Still, the stage is green. The stage lights are green. The theater is abundant and green, still dripping with life. But now the theater contains the barest hint of sadness, not the sadness of inevitable destruction, but a sadness of perpetuity, of mossy hills without a conceivable end. We have entered and brought a shutter. The walls try to rest. Stuck upright, they linger. The stage itself is firm, thoughtless. Its hint of sadness is our own. With or without us, it will go on. And still, perched at the edge of the stage, I do not feel that I've reached the woods. Instead, surrounded by green, a feeling grows, a feeling that I'm ready to return, that I'm finished with retreat. My toes in the water are not water. They are my toes. The water is getting cold. So I take my feet out, pull boots on, rise. As I descend the stage and walk up the aisle, my friends cannot look away from the fire, but it is so easy. I walk through the doors at the back of the theater. I pull them shut behind me. The lobby's just as we left it, our boot prints in mud on the floor. The lobby smells like ancient bleach, a pang of loss. Then I am upright, still curiously alive. The afternoon sun crawls through the lobby's smudged glass doors. I open them to the wish of an incidental breeze. I step off the curb and start walking. So that's me trying to navigate that theater, you know, and trying to try to come through it and out of it and find something where, where I already was <laughs> instead of trying to leave all the time. Um, and I started to do that in these, these moss poems too. And I started trying to do it in the, the stories from the long line of men too. And, and, and just trying to find out like what happens, what happens when you um, allow yourself to actually just be part of nature already and uh, not constantly contrast yourself with the world, but remember that you're part of it. Um, and I still don't have the words for that, you know, but I think uh, that's why I had to tell stories instead. I went out in the woods to find myself but the dogs found me first. They knew I had bones. They knew it better than I did, and they sniffed like aches at my viscid skin. We got to know each other, me and the dogs. We got to know the day's unearthly glow, which dwindled and darkened before a long speckle with stars. At night, the dogs' eyes stood out like planets orbiting me, but I had resolved that my heat was no more my heat than it was theirs. I was their feast. I had two feet on the ground, then one foot and a knee. Then both knees and I was prying open the jaws of the largest dog, reaching down its throat, pulling my head inward and tucking in my toes behind. The dog, full of what it wanted, fell to the dirt. The thump rocked me from outside. The other dogs snorted and raged with jealousy. They ripped down the forest, left it as tattered as the sky. At its center, the big dog and I were a black hole. We curled into ourselves. Soon we knew. Time would find its way to us, to rest. I went out once. I saw the woods piled into cities, cities piled into coasts. Coasts piled into museums that crushed cities, but for the hardy few who scrambled up and into the marble halls. Cyclones ravaged the shoreline. I went back to bed. What is seen cannot be unseen. What is skinned cannot be wrapped up safe. So dreams, abandoned toes in sand, siren lights arriving, a gentlewoman pulling granules one by one out of my eye. The sky opens and contains an untouched ceiling. Celestial white noise ushers me back to sleep. I went out once, life was wet and shivering. And I'm just gonna read 
four more moss poems. Um, you know, just trying to find my way with all this stuff. And um, I appreciate y'all finding your way with me. This one's called Tucker Monopsis Chlorophylla. The summer waved its bones. Lightning shrank, lively chorus one. The clouds of payment, shoes lost to the bubbling night. Our shrouds, lively chorus two, catch on shelves, three, four, five. We want ice cold until we venture in. This is Jim. Gymnostimum recurrostrum. We won the meat prize. Sunday was God's. Less is less than more. But it does its best. The hills sing in the trees. The hills. We try desperately to contain ourselves. This is Usnea longissima. Bra straps and code. I used to dream. Childhood helped. I eat a lot of soup. Violets, take a picture of me. And this is Eurynchium organum. These are the feathers. Do not elect. Sun, 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 sun. The delicate madly. Recommend nothing. Green on a background of green. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I have the great pleasure of getting to introduce Orchid Tierney. Um, and we also got to have some conversations about our books and how um, particularly your work on lichen um, and the stuff I've been thinking about um, with moss. There's these great kind of overlappings there. And so um, I'll read Orchid's bio now. Orchid Tierney is the author of the chapbook, Looking at the Tiny. Mad Lichen on the Surface of Reading from Essay Press this year and the collection A Year of Misreading the Wildcats Operating System 2019. Originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand, she is an assistant professor of English at Kenyon College. Please welcome Rikid Tierney. Um, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, but can we also just say your work was really amazing? <laughs> and um, um, Dennis and I have had a lot of conversations about our mutual connections. Um, my interest is obviously in in lichen, um, uh, but um, I was I'm really fascinated by Dennis's um, moss poems. Um, you really have to get his book. Um, this is I guess this is a plug for all our books, really. But um, Dennis's poems are are really sort of um, very sort of experimental in form um, and structure. And what really is what really sort of astonishes me with his moss poems is just the way that the lines are really consolidate. Um, a, a unit of thought in, in ways that I think are really interesting, um, which you'll be able to see if you buy his book. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dennis, um, um, for that introduction. I'm actually going to do something a little bit different. Um, usually when I start reading this collection, um, I don't know, well, yeah, it, we can kind of sort of see it there. Um, um, I, I usually just start and launch into it, but I kind of want to start with the poem that actually um, started my my engagement um, with um, with 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 both Lycan, um, but also this poet, um, Lou Ouch, um, who was a beat poet. Um, and, uh, you know, he had, a, he had a little bit of success and as a, as a beat poet in the 50s and 60s, but sadly, he died by suicide in 1971. Um, in, um, in in the mountains of, of um, California, and unfortunately, his, he was never found. Um, so so there's something about his his disappearance that has inspired, I think, a little bit of mythologizing um, about about him that I in ways that um, that I think we can unpack. Um, but he had he wrote this amazing poem called Springtime um, in the Rockies Lichen, which I'm going to read. Uh, for you right now. All these years I overlooked them in the racket of the rest, the symbiotic splash of plant and fungus feeding on rock, on sun, a little moisture, air, tiny acid factories dissolving salt from living rocks and eating them. Here they are, blooming, 
trail rock, talus and scree, all dusted with it, rust, ivory, brilliant yellow-green and cliffs like murals, huge panels streaked and patched quietly with shooting stars and lupine at the base, closer with the gas, a city of cups, clumps of mushrooms, and where do the plants begin? Why are they doing this? In this big sky and all around me, peaks and the mounting glaciers, why am I made to kneel and peer at tiny? These are the stamps of the final envelope. How can the poisons reach them in such thin air? How can they care for the loss of a million breaths? What possibly could make their ground more bare? Let it all die. The hushed globe will wait and wait for what is now so small and slow to open it again. As now, indeed, as it opens again, the scentless velvet crumbler of the rocks, this lichen. So what really sort of astonishes me about this poem is the way that uh, Luwalt really does collapse the human with the more than human world. And the fact that this lichen has been able to pull this, this human being down um, to make him stop in his in his in his moments, and to and to force force him to really examine their their complexities. Um, it's just such an incredible incredible poem. And I'm going to read um, just a few pages of my own, um, I guess my response to this poem, but also my own grappling with um, with with Lou Welch and his his joy of the sublime of these lichen, but also with the with the tragedy of his life. He was someone that could have lived a very different life if he had access to perhaps if if mental health care was actually available to him. And um and, and in many respects, this is you know the condition that um, that many of us um grapple with today. Looking at the time looking at the tiny. Lichen are the tiny collaborators of the forest, two little personalities of fungi and green algae, little owls, tiny tubs of collegial kinship between organic components, two personae, little knowledges living among filaments. Naturalist Trevor Goward proposes that lichens are fungi that have discovered agriculture. And seeing lichen through this anthropomorphic lens as farms of sustainable husbandry might limit our full appreciation of the meticulousness of these tiny infrastructures. Goward persists, however, to insist upon their complexities with increasingly descriptive language that underscores the variety of their functions and relationships. Lichen as dietary strategy of certain fungi, he writes. Lichen as range extender for photocells. Lichen as control parasitism. Lichen as mutualism. Lichen as fungal greenhouse. Lichen as goal. Lichen as culture chamber. Lichen as symbiotic phenotype. Lichen as organism. Lichen as ecosystem. Lichen as emergent property. He doesn't quite succeed. Lichens cannot be likened since they're unlike anything else. Indeed, lichens are their own culture-making depositories of strange life. The algae in this mutualist relationship provides nutrients for, through photosynthesis for the fungi. And for their part, the fungi protect the algae, helping it to thrive in dry climes. Oh, this familiar sweetness, this unusual kinship also offers sustenance for other species. Some birds will strip lichens from trees to furnish the lining of their nests. Some humans will drop to their knees to examine them. And what can I say of this marvelous plural thing, this beautiful, blotchy, multicolor, not animal, not plant, more than human warehouse, this bioindexical counter of air quality, this tiny organic engine containing two separate identities, Lichens are their own empire, their own fantastic kingdom of small likeness. Lichen as vertical geography, lichen as horizontal collage, lichen as forensic analysis, lichen as surface readers. Lichens as surface readers, as organic communities, lichens ignore depth in favor of the axis, the dimensional, the parataxis. They are expert, non-discriminating counter-scholars of the layer, madly blanketing the rinds of trees and rocks, benches and metal, plastic bone and glass, regardless of elevation and climate. They are small kingdoms of likeness, 
While lichens have a superficial relationship with trees, their hospitality doesn't always benefit the surfaces of non-sentient environmental and cultural entities to which they can be quite destructive. Case in point, for her 1922 doctoral dissertation, Ethel Malor documented 16 vetriculus species of lichen on the surface of stained church windows in France. Certain colors show more susceptibility to alteration than others, she notes. Purple, green, blue, red, amber, and particularly amethyst glasses are all deeply corroded. In his poem, Springtime in the Rockies Lichen, beat poet Lou Welch calls them tiny acid factories and crumbler of the rocks, two compelling images that gesture to the potent industriousness of these non-human workers. These annihilators of religious relics, these miniature ecosystems, these fungal greenhouses allied the separation between human and wilderness, rural and urban spheres, for they epitomize nature culture, a concept that Donna Haraway employs to describe the synthesis of nature and culture, the human and the non-human. We cannot read lichens without the cultural imaginations of biology, art, and poetry, given how language loaded they are. Look at Goward's an analogies. Lichens are embedded with signs and interpretation. Semiotics entrap me too. Lichens are open culture chambers, biosocial destroyers of rocks and stained glass windows. Wow, forget it. We're not living in the Anthropocene. It's the lichen scene. Lichen's power lies in their surface spreading of small catastrophes. Surface reading is the uneven reading of looking at. Lichens don't read surfaces symmetrically. They grow haphazardly depending upon the conditions of the layer, upon the rough rinds of trees and rocks, benches and metal, plastic and bone. This patchiness is owed to their unusual methods of asexual reproduction. They granulate and crumble. They dispense on the wind. The fungi can also produce spores, but however lichens choose to reproduce, each dispersal of their bodies is an encounter with chance. Where they land is an opportunity for new growth, new surfaces for reading a tree, the soil, a rock, a bone, stained glass window. The surface finds its purpose through the lichen. Its identity is transformed when, it's, when it opens itself to the lichen's industrial acid factories. For lichens, an unwelcoming surface means death, while a barren surface encourages them to thrive and to connect. They are, as Welch writes, the stamps on the final envelope. For each small patch, lichens are their own little worlds, planetoids on a fallen rock. Pluto's on a rock, and everywhere I look, I see millions of their small gestures. Everywhere I looked, I saw nothing of their small gestures. On one particularly hot summer day, I was a tree walking in the Riverview Nature Park on the edge of Nebraska City, searching for some lichens. I had come to Nebraska for an artist residency and I'd hoped to use this time to think and reflect as I worked on my next manuscript, All Our Names Are Kin, A Field Guide to Future Flora. And as I researched Midwestern plants, I realized that lichens were really outside of any botanical frame of reference. Like Welch, all these years, I overlooked them in the racket of the rest. I was thus insistent on my walk to locate the various species of lichens, if only to photograph their presence. I truly wanted to see them. It had rained heavily the night before and the morning's moisture remained suspended a foot above the O horizon. Against the canopy and tree trunks, my body felt transformed into tubulars of hard light. I could smell tubs of forest scent, damp soil, car exhaust, hallowed bodies of beaches lying prone on the floor, wet leaves still in flight. Motorized carapaces of beetles aloft in pencil webs, uncanny insects in the process of deletion, hostile tumors bursting from debris. I may have noticed the scent and the light, but on the surface, I was a terrible close reader of the woods. I wasn't proficient at fighting lichens, despite the fact they are literally everywhere. I live too much in my head. I don't observe, connect, or do. My walking companion, Maya, however, missed nothing. She saw everything, the fantastic facts and the smallness of the fallen log, the boisterous mushrooms provoked into bloom, little cats in delight pushing through the wet earth, 
a bent plastic picnic table and bench. How could I have missed this debris? One covered in moss and a heft of air. The snail shells wedged into the dirt, the tick on my leg. The misshapen trees that had uprooted themselves fleeing from the forest path. Maya was familiar with the approximation of space. She understood or appeared to the concept of the middle. The forest was full of it. Spatiality was a constant diffusion. Events happen everywhere, in the weeding bed, the canopy, the detritus, and the disagreements between them. We ambulated down a path without any sense of definition. At one point, we traipsed up a hill and found ourselves at another parking lot, another entrance, another open road, another center. Forget it, where did we begin? I'm constantly reminded how it's impossible to escape in America. Remoteness is another configuration of not urban, but also not rural, nature culture. We retraced our set steps with Maya, pointing at curiosities along the way. Look here, she said. Look here, and here, and here, and here, and here, here. Wow, I said. Wow. Observe, connect, and do. I think Maya knew how to look at the tiny because she knew how to read the surface of the tree, the rock, the soil. For my part, I was sensitive to the art of looking up and down, but not the art of looking at. I'm going to stop there um, because that is a good place to stop.